you like having money. <laughs> Pretty much everyone. But some of us have it. Some of us don't. Some of us have a lot of it, and some of us have very little of it. Some of us have so much that we don't know what to do with it, and some of us have so little that we're scraping to get a penny to put food on our plates. These girls have absolutely none of it. A lot of them are there because their parents don't have enough money to feed them, so they've come to this organisation to help, for help. Um, I found this organisation online. I decided to cycle 7,000 kilometres, and then I found this organisation, and I met with the founder, Phil, and he told me this story about these two girls. And these two girls came to this organisation in the morning, and they had breakfast, they just scoffed it down, and they went away and they played, and they were called in for lunch. And they went, what? Lunch? And they went, yeah, you know, you're supposed to eat three times a day. And they were like, no, we, we eat every other day. And um, so they couldn't quite grasp the fact that they were supposed to eat three times a day. So when it got to like time for cookies and milk, they thought they died and gone to heaven. Um, but once I'd heard that story, I was like, well, I'm gonna, I want to understand what it's like to be them. I want to understand what it's like to go through that experience of not having money, not knowing if your food is going to come today or tomorrow, whether you're going to have a bed tonight or whether you're not. So I decided to do this journey without any money and it lasted me 164 days and I didn't spend any money in that time. Now, I want you to try and empathise with me and them as well. So if you could all close your eyes for me. Now I want you to imagine a time that you were really, really hungry and that could be this morning because you missed breakfast, that could be last week because you were on a diet, but I want you to imagine that real hunger feeling. Now I want you to imagine the fact that there is no bed at home for you, there is no food in the fridge for you, there's no money in your pocket to go and buy food. Now open your eyes. Now that was an example of day 16, lasting me a, a journey lasting me 164 days. And I forgot to add in there that I'm at 3,000 metres above altitude and I'm pushing a bike up the Andes. I've been pushing this bike for about four days. I hadn't had dinner, I hadn't had lunch. My stomach was cramping and it was raining. When I started planning this expedition, I sought the help of some professionals in, in this industry. And Randolph Fiennes begrudgingly became a patron of the expedition and he told me that it was, in his opinion, far too great a risk. Um, and I spoke to the RGS and they said um, that what I was doing was morally unacceptable and obviously there's always people, when you've proposed an idea that you want to do a dream, there's always people saying, no, you can't do it, it's impossible, you can't live five months without money, you're going to need money for food, you're going to need money for, for shelter and X, Y and Z. So instead of listening to them, I went, oh, oh, I want to plan my journey. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So I started in Ecuador, and I was planning on starting in Colombia, but my husband went crazy, and he was like, no, there's so much danger, and blah, 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 and I was like, okay, fine, I'll start in Ecuador. So I started in Ecuador, across the Andes to the Amazon, crossed them again to the, to the coast, crossed them again to Bolivia, uh, went through the salt flats, high altitude deserts, went through Paraguay and the Pampas in Argentina. So all in all, that was about 7,000 kilometers, um, at the start, I was averaging about 7 to 15 kilometres a day because I was so hungry. But by the end, I was doing just over well, 137, 140 was my daily, which is about 60, 70 miles a day. Um, I started, before I left, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do some weight training. So I waited and I waited <laughs> and I waited a bit more and I wasn't really getting any fitter. But... Uh. <laughs> That bike, uh, to give you an idea, I weigh about 64 kilos. So I'm not the lightest, but that bike weighed nearly 100 kilos. So when I got on that bike, because I hadn't done any weight training, not the right kind anyway, I got on the bike and I kept, it took me about three days for my muscles to learn how to ride a bike with that much weight. I kept falling off and having to put my foot down and I was so scared going downhill because it would go too fast and I couldn't control it. So the first few days I was like, down these super lightweight panniers. <laughs> They're not very super lightweight. <laughs> I, um, I just put a few too many heavy things inside them uh, to make them lightweight anymore. <laughs> so if anyone's planning on doing a, a cycling expedition, pack your stuff, 
take half of it out, take half of it out again, and then you might be around the, uh, the right kilogram markage. So when I went to the Andes for the first time, I just about learned how to ride my bike, but it was such a difficult time for me. No one was giving me any food. I couldn't really find shelter. It was constantly raining. And I found myself constantly looking at my feet, just pushing this bike up the mountain. And it wasn't a case of, you know, getting through the day. It was a case of getting through the minute, getting through the hour. As a result, getting through the day. I could not look at the journey in, in its entirety. Uh, it, I just wanted to quit. Um, and at one day, one day I was pushing the bike up this mountain, looking down at my feet. The past four houses behind me had rejected me and they said, no, they wouldn't give me food or shelter. It was about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. I was wet and I was hungry. And I remember getting to this house and it was on my left and I just burst into tears. I was so drained. And this bike fell to the floor. I didn't put it on the floor. I dropped it to the floor and I fell to my knees and I sat on the road crying my eyes out. And Cho, the person that cycled first with me, I went across the road to ask the lady if she'd help us. And I looked at her with tears streaming down my face. And she looked back at me and she made eye contact. And she shook her finger. And I was like, <laughs> it was like obviously the clearest no that she could make, but it was in her complete right to say no. No one had to help us, but I had to pick up my bike and keep pushing. There was no one else that was going to help me. There was no car that would come and pick me up. I didn't take this, by the way. There was no shop that would, I could buy food at. I literally just had to pick up this bike and keep pushing. And that's just what we have to do in life. We just have to keep picking the bike up and keep moving. The roads were barbaric. Absolutely barbaric. That's how much it rained. We had to push these bikes up hills like this, and clearly I'm enjoying myself, clearly I'm having a right old good time. Um, every now and then we'd find this amazing camping spot to set up camp and we would find dry wood and we'd like cook some plain rice and when you're that hungry, plain rice tastes really goddamn good. And I'd sit in the tent with my full little belly and I'd look out at the view and just go, you know what? I'm in a bloody good place. This, the views are incredible, but when I was in such a dark spiral, when anyone's in a dark spiral, it, it can be really difficult to look up and appreciate the view around you. Um, it's a happy day because now we're in Peru, so we're like one step closer. But uh, it's like a whole other country that we have to do. And when truth, I just kind of want to go home. Like, it should have been a really, I know, I just only just stopped welling up when I see that video. But it should have been a really happy day. But the past three weeks of the Ecuadorian Andes had scarred me so much inside that I thought, Christ, Peru's double the distance. It's going to be the same. I have to cross the Andes twice. So all of my experience had told me that this trip was going to be awful. It was going to be terrible. I should be scared because that was my past experience. But then we got to the Amazon and the Peruvian people started giving me loads of food. So, of course, like there was food in front of me and I just scoffed it in my face. I turned into this huge little porker. I'd lost so much weight in the Andes. And uh, my fiance came to visit me for a couple of weeks. And he went, you haven't lost any weight at all. And I was like, shut up, you don't know the half of it. Um, but there were amazing things. There were these tarantulas, purple tarantulas, the size of like my hand, face and there were these electric blue butterflies that were just floating by and snakes everywhere and these amazing streams that I would bathe in every night. And if I was hot during the day, I'd just dive into a river and cool off. And, and it was flat. <laughs> and there was food and it was flat. So I was happy as Larry. This is an example of some of the food that I was finding and eating along the way too. I'd see fruit as almost a bit of a luxury, so I'd be a bit scared to ask for it unless it was mangoes falling off someone's trees. But the Bolivian, well, all of the South Americans really have this tendency to just throw rubbish out of their car. And there would just be so much food on the side of the road. So I'd be looking out all the time when I was cycling and a load of it would still be in its wrappers and like biscuits and loads of fruit would fall off the back of cartons. So albeit I did have to 
like washed some ants off the watermelon and I probably ate quite a few in the process, but it's just extra protein. Um, and also I found, oh, the guavas were awful. I kept picking them off the trees, biting them, looking down and having maggots, like just seeing maggots in them. And I'm like, oh, oh no, I'm not that hungry. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. And then um, I found a tin of, well, I found a box of 64 cans of tuna. And that was my protein source for pretty much the entire way. Albeit it was the tuna that um, had bones and stuff in it. So it wasn't the nicest tuna, but it was tuna. And I became quite possessive of food as well. Um, so I turned 23. I'm 23 now. And I turned 23 um, along this journey. And I was so worried that my birthday wasn't going to be an enjoyable one. And that no one would take me in and I'd just be alone and feeling awful. But this family took me in the day before my birthday and they asked me if I'd like to stay um, with the people I was cycling with. And obviously, of course, I was like, yes, yes, take me, take me. And I remember bathing in the, um, in the stream with their like, uh, teenage daughters and having fun. And this girl here, her name's Carmen. We still text now and she wants to come to England. And I made some really lovely friendships. And not only did I have so much fun with them on my birthday, they bought me a birthday cake. Like never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that someone would buy me a birthday cake. So I woke up on my birthday and Carmen and one of her sisters went and disappeared and they came back in the afternoon with this birthday cake. Like how beautiful is the human race? So at this point, I made it through the Ecuadorian Andes. I'd made it through Peru, the Andes twice. Um, Cho, the person that cycled with me first, he got hit by a minivan, so I had to go home. I then got attacked. My fiancé that came to cycle with me for a month got sideswiped by a truck, so he had to go home. Ness, who then cycled with me, got so sunburnt, she looked like a little swollen grape, and um, she knocked her knee and peeled half of her skin off with her. Um, and she's still got like this scar on her leg from it, so I'm starting to think I had a bad, quite bad, bad luck with people cycling with me. But at this point, my elder sister, my older sister Claire, was cycling with me. And I don't know if Paraguay was such a turning point for me because I had my sister with me so we could cycle along and sing Disney songs and laugh and have banter, or whether it was the fact that I knew I had no more Andes ahead of me. Do you know that I cycled nearly three times the height of Everest? I went up Everest almost three times. Yeah. And, um, but I hit Paraguay and all of the negativity from Ecuador and all of me feeling like a burden on society, like no one wanted me, like everyone just wanted me to go away. It disappeared in Paraguay. Everyone was tooting, but not like the get out of the way toots, it's like the go you type toots. And they were like smiling and they were laughing and they were giving me thumbs up. And it just made me so happy inside to know that I wasn't a burden anymore, that people weren't seeing me coming going, oh God, I've heard about this one. Um, the people were so kind out there. Um, and I finally got ice cream. <laughs> you don't know how many times I saw children with ice cream and I just wanted to hit them, take the ice cream and run off. <laughs> I feel mean saying it, but it's the truth. <laughs> and I cycled past these um, garages, um, petrol stations, and they'd have the little the fridge freezers with all the ice creams in. And I'd be like... <laughs> Um, because I couldn't buy them and I wanted them so bad and it took me nearly four months but I got my ice cream I got it and it's big and it was yummy um, this lady's called Adeline she's a, a one of 12 children of an American family that moved from America to Paraguay and they were such saints they were so lovely and they took us in and um, yeah really really lovely family and again in Paraguay, me and my sister were cycling along and we were coming to Asuncion, which is where my sister, there, she was, ha she was going home and my other sister was coming, but there was like a five day period of waiting. And I'm like, oh God, because can't, I can't just check into a hotel. I just, I have to find somewhere to stay, whether that's just camping on the side of the road. But then I'm like, how am I going to find food? Because I can't beg from the same places over and over again. So I have to keep moving on a daily basis so I don't basically piss anyone off by asking too much. Um, but these guys just stopped around me on the side of the road and they asked if we were okay and they gave us some water and they gave us um, some homemade biscuits that her mum had just made. And, um, you know, we all stood by the side of the road and they took our hands and we did this prayer circle and they prayed for us. 
And they said that once we reached Asuncion, we were more than welcome to stay with them. And they'd throw us a big barbecue asado and we'd have all this like food. So me and my sister were like, come on, come on. <laughs> um, and truth, we got to Asuncion and I found a McDonald's, thank you, free Wi-Fi. Like shared my location and within 20 minutes, one of their friends, Joella, came and picked us up in her pickup. And um, she hosted me for five days whilst my sister went and my other sister came and she took us to a supermarket. That's my sister as well, by the way. Um, she took us to a supermarket and she went, you can have whatever you want, pick it up and I'll buy it. And I just went, <laughs> like I'd not had an option of what I wanted to eat in four months, in over four months. So someone telling me, pick what you want, I'll buy it for you. I didn't know how to cope. And still, when I got back to England, myself and my husband went to the supermarket and um, picked up carrots. And I was like, <laughs> and I had to go and like pretend I was looking at bacon for five minutes whilst I stopped crying. And then I went and picked up yogurts and I was like, <laughs> so in the end I just couldn't go to supermarkets because they were just this embarrassment for me because I could I was so overwhelmed with the fact that I had these choices again um so yeah I didn't realize that I'd be so scarred by supermarkets so I finally got to the organization that I'd been cycling towards and cycling towards and that's my other sister there with her tongue out beautiful lady that she is and <coughs> The crazy thing is that the lady in stripes, that's the wife of the other person that runs the place that helped found it. And her first son died at the age of nine from leukemia, which is why they started this organization to help children. Um, and unfortunately, their second son now at the age of 22 has got leukemia as well, and he's not on his best legs. Um, but they still pour every day, every day they pour their heart into this organization, looking and caring for these girls. So... They're one of my biggest inspirations. The fact that these girls can go through what they've gone through and still run around and play with me and my sister like they're just in an after school club. And I remember being in the back garden and a child defense lawyer coming into the driveway and two of the girls standing up and saying, oh, excuse us, we've got to go in for a meeting now. And it was quite shocking for me because I just went, oh, OK, you're not here for an after school club. You are here for a reason. Um, so I hope to continue trying to raise money for them and awareness for them. Um, I asked each and every individual, well, not every individual girl, a lot of them, if they like living there. And they all said yes. And, they all, and then I asked, obviously, well, why? And they said, because we get to learn. And it was like, oh, I just love you even more. Because it's always shocking when children come back and say the one thing that they enjoy most in life is learning and having an education and being able to study. Because a lot, I think a lot of children in our country, they're like, I don't want to go to school, I don't want to do this. Whereas for these girls, the reason that they loved being there so much was because they got to study. Um, I went from crying on a daily basis to smiling and laughing on a daily basis. So that number there roughly translates, translates to six days of cycling. So it's pretty goddamn shocked. <laughs> um, and it was weird, I started, trying to understand the whole law of attraction. I don't know if people, any of you know this whole law of attraction, but at the start I was putting out such a negative feeling and I was in this whole downward spiral and all I was getting was negativity. That's what I was putting out, that's what I was getting back. And near the end, all I was feeling was positivity and laughter and happiness. And it got to the point where I had to tell people to stop giving me food. I didn't have to ask anymore. I had to tell people to stop giving me food because they kept trying to give me food. Um, and this chap here, you can see in the distance, me and my sister were like smiling and laughing and just having a good time in the bikes. And he stopped and said, you know, you guys have got a really good onda, which is wave in Spanish. Um, and he said, and he came and found us and gave us these little presents of a mate cup, which is an Argentinian drink, and a bombilla, which is the straw that you drink out of. Um, and we were like, oh, thank you very much. And obviously I'm filming because I filmed the whole thing. And then we went off and cycled. And then in the evening, because this happened in the morning, in the evening he came and found us and said, I really want to, like, there's just a village just slightly further on. I mean, there's a cabana house there and I'll pay for a room for you. And it was like, oh, it was just incredible. Um, so he paid for a room for us and gave us presents. So that's when I really started to wonder and ponder about this whole law of attraction. 
And this is just an interesting photo because I found that thing in my mouth. <laughs> I was just sipping my uh, coffee one morning and like, <laughs> and this cockroach came out. So if you want to go on adventures, just be willing that you might get cockroaches in your mouth. It's funny, looking back at the photos, the first lot of, of me being quite sad, my, like, I'm always looking away into the distance. I'm like pulling funny faces to mask the fact that I'm not really having that much fun. And all the photos near the end, they're of me smiling and laughing and having such a good time. And looking back on them, I'm so thankful that I persevered through those hard times because I got to the best time at the end. And if I had given up in Ecuador where I felt so bad, I would have never left this expedition with this heart of love towards humanity that I have. But it's only because I persevered through the hardest bit. Um, so after like five months of like over five months of cycling with no money, that's water in Buenos Aires. So I am done. I am going to a hotel. <laughs> and now it's raining, so I'm going. <laughs> I always get annoyed with my sister because she's like three weeks and she got the best bit when we finished. <laughs> um, but undoubtedly, this was one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. But I'm so thankful for it. And I'm so thankful that I got to experience that really hard part at the start. Because if I hadn't experienced that, the end bit wouldn't have been so good. And I'm so thankful I got to understand that fear and desperation and that hunger. And yet I got also to experience the love and joy of kind people. Um, and if there's two messages I want you to take away from this, it's persevere. I always say the difference between those that make it and those that don't is perseverance. And also, go for your dreams. It doesn't matter if it's to live in a library, to read 100 books in a month, to open a coffee shop or climb Everest. Whatever it is, you can do it if you just persevere. Good.